Hi, my name is Egosa Moigui, and I'm managing partner of EcoVC. We're a seed, early stage, and early growth technology investing platform focused on Africa and Africa-focused businesses. And what's typically what sort of between two numbers? What sort of funding are you putting in? Twenty-five thousand dollars to ten million dollars. And give me three examples of companies you put money into, and why you put money into them. So on the small scale pre-seed, we made an investment in a company called MyPaddy, which is a student housing uh, marketplace, solving a very interesting and very big problem around matching students with, with verified landlords. Mm. Uh, we did a pre-seed investment in that. We made an investment in a company called LifeBank. LifeBank is a supply chain optimization platform that has built very interesting business around sourcing blood and blood supplies and fulfilling demand by healthcare providers. It has essentially reduced the time for research, discovery, collation and delivery from up to two to three days to 55 minutes or less. And then we also invested in a company called Grow Intelligence, which we believe is the largest real-time agriculture analytics database in the world. Uh, bring in a very important set of insights and decision-making support to agriculture and agriculture-related intelligence. And when you look at a startup or you look at a company to invest in, what are the, what are the three things you're looking for? I think the first thing is the overall level of conviction of the entrepreneur and, the, and, and his or her founding team. The what do you mean by conviction? Zero optionality. Yeah. That's what we look for. Zero optionality. So commitment at some level. This is, we will no do side this hustles, or, or no. we will just quit. Yeah. Die. Yeah. Pretty much. And, and the zero optionality framework is very important. I mean, that's not to say that they don't have any optionality. It's a nice soundbite. But it's really walking away going that this is going to be the most important thing this entrepreneur is going to be focused on for the next five to ten years. So that's a very important piece of it. The second thing is the very specific, unique insight the entrepreneur has into both the market and the product and how both go together. And that's a very important thing that we've talked about sort of this concept of cracking the code, mm. but you usually know an entrepreneur who's figured it out. And the third and most important thing is the entrepreneur's ability to attract and retain talent because these, these are markets that are very high friction generally, and so it's really difficult to do this one, or one, one man or one woman shows, which generally it is anyway, mm. but in these markets that, that becomes the problem that's even more exacerbated. So we are very, very focused on entrepreneurs who can attract the talent. And so we call them the WOW entrepreneurs, W-O-W, mm. with or without entrepreneurs, which is when they walk out of our offices, we're going, that entrepreneur is going to do this with or without us. Mm. So we want to be with that entrepreneur. And you were talking earlier during the panel session um, about international investors sometimes not understanding the kind of um, problems, difficulties, challenges that startups face. What are the kinds of examples that you've had where you, you say, oh, this, is, this is what happens? So I, I, you know, I, I won't necessarily get into very specific examples, but I'll, I'll give you, I think, you know, maybe I might be slightly glossing over, but I think yeah. there, there are a couple of things that happen in some of these markets that are, that are, that can be quite derailing to these startups. And so one of the things that a good friend of mine, Reid Hoffman, used to say was that you go to market and you win on product. Mm. And in, in many markets, that's probably true. In, in African markets, that is more likely not true than it is. Mm. And the reason why is that there are all these unwritten rules and dynamics that can sort of drive your ability to be successful or not. Mm. And that also means that when you're competing, you're not necessarily competing with the best product in the market. So somebody just wakes up one day and decides to call on some regulator or something, call in a favor, and before you know it, the regular issues are at your door and says, oh, you're doing X or Y. Mm. It takes you two weeks to sort of prove the fact that you were fine. You were doing everything on the up and up, mm. but it derails you. Mm. And these are things that are possible and happen actually a lot more often. Mm. And so what then happens is you have an international investor. They're thinking, oh, there was probably something 
up here and the truth is no I mean, we don't invest yeah. in those types of Something things Something they should have known about right but it's not true yeah. it's just literally this is how people compete yes and it doesn't make sense when you're sitting in London and New York yeah it makes sense when you're sitting in Lagos and Nairobi yeah, absolutely <laughs> and so that's 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 one of those things that ha that ha that will happen and you have to sort of help coordinate and translate also talked about we, we often talk about the risk for the um, investor but what about the risk for the entrepreneur? What were you meaning by that? Yeah, so I pointed out that there's, there's a concept which we call internally KYI, Know Your mm. Investor. And we've always wondered as to whether or not there's some sort of framework for being able to determine the amount of risk mm. an investor poses to your startup. Now, when I was in the Valley thinking through this, mm. one of the things I was thinking about was, you know, as companies scale, you know, humans don't, mm. which is sort of a challenge. And, you know, and skill sets and applicability to every life cycle stage of a company um, will evolve, which mm. is the reason why some teams eventually have to get replaced because they just don't scale. Mm. I think that's true of investors as well, mm. right? So there's that part of it. But then the other part of it, which is, what does this investor pose in terms of risk to a small African startup? Because the investor may have a lot of money, but the sources of the money may be suspect. Yep. Right. Or particularly in Nigeria. Or, correct. Or yeah, the interactions that the, the yeah. investor has, the, yeah. the people the investor interacts with, you know, and yeah. we've always said these companies, you know, because they're really small, are just one shutdown away from shutdown. Yeah. So so being able to do that math, but these entrepreneurs don't really care. And you tell them, you know, yeah. you really should think about this. But and then down the road, down the road, you know, one of these big DFIs wants to invest in you, hmm. looks at your your cap table and says we are not going to invest in you. They don't tell you why, hmm. but then we as investors hear that, oh, there are some issues on the cap table. Hmm. You know, <laughs> and, and you're saying, this is the problem. 